For our last few videos, we've spent our time looking at the microscopic levels of life, uh, cells and membranes, and now we want to turn our attention to the full-size organisms, plants, animals, and how they survive in their different types of environments. And so for this video, we'll look at adaptations to the environments, and this is for form and function B4.1. Before we look at specific adaptations, we need to define what makes up an organism's place of residence, where they're found. And this is called a habitat. Uh, and this is essentially where an organism lives. It's the geographic location or type of place that's inhabited, and it would include the physical conditions as well as the specific type of ecosystem. It can apply, the habitat can apply to a single organism, a population, species, or even a community and a community would be made up of multiple different species within the same geographic area. Within the environment of an organism, there's both living factors and non-living factors that can influence uh, the species, the organism. And the living factors are referred to as biotic, and the non-living are uh, referred to as abiotic. Uh, sunlight, water, uh, or precipitation, uh, pH conditions, salinity, etc. cetera. Uh, abiotic factors have a greater influence in extreme environments, uh, and in particular where there's low population densities, where there's, there's not a lot of individuals. And these would be, uh, examples of these would be like in the desert or the taiga, uh, both of which we'll talk a little bit more uh, here a little bit later. And so then o over time we see organisms and species, uh, not individual organisms, but the species as a whole, over time adapt to the particular environmental conditions uh, through the process of natural selection of where they're found. And either they are, the, the species is able to do this through the presence of genetic variation, or they don't and they would go extinct. Uh, and so individuals with the traits characteristics that are best fit for the environment, environmental conditions, they're able to survive. They reproduce and pass on those traits, uh, typically with variation. Offspring don't exactly look like their, their parents. Uh, and this would be an example of heredity or inheritance. And then over time, this results in an adaptation of that characteristic that enables the species to survive in its particular environment. So one first example of a species that has really specific adaptations would be lime grasses of sand dunes. Uh, and these are found on the seaward edge of dunes in North America. So we have them in close proximity being in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and sand dunes are just mounds of windblown sand that uh, collect at the top of beaches and it provides or uh, presents a lot of challenges to species because there's high salt concentrations being next to the sea, uh, there's lack of water retention, the ability to, to retain water, and then just the fact that sand accumulates. It's typically very windy at the beach, uh, especially the Oregon coast, and so sand accumulates. And so these are challenges that the species would need to be able to overcome to survive. And so the lime grasses have some specific adaptations uh, to be able to survive in this condition, such as a waxy cuticle. Uh, the cuticle is the top part of the leaf, and a, a waxy presence of that helps to reduce uh, transpiration, which is the loss of water through the plant. Uh, the stomata, which is the, the openings, the holes on the bottom of the leaf, the indent uh, have indentions, kind of like a red blood cell, like a, a small indent, and that allows humid air to remain or, or accumulate there, and then that reduces transpiration even in windier conditions. Uh, the leaves of the grasses can roll during droughts to reduce the surface area. More surface area means more water loss. Uh, it has underground stems called rhizomes that grow upwards to extend deep into the dune and be able to obtain and collect water. And then the uh, collection of carbohydrates and root and leaves uh, helps to increase the osmotic potential and thus increase the amount of water that, that's pulled in. And so the presence of these carbohydrates uh, changes the balance uh, of uh, uh, water to the carbohydrates and it causes water to be able to uh, uh, move into the cells and into the plant through osmosis. A second example that we see is found in the mangrove swamps and these are not in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they develop in the or along the coast and tropics in sheltered conditions uh, where mud accumulates uh, flooded with seawater at high tide and it creates a waterlogged anaerobic uh, soil condition that has high salt concentrations. Florida is probably uh, in North America a place that you would think of having m mangroves and these uh, mangrove plants trees have some really some specific adaptations to deal with the conditions. Um, first, they secrete excess salt from the leaf. So there's lots of salt because they're growing in seawater. So they're able to secrete that from the leaf. The roots are co coated in cork to reduce salt absorption. 
Uh, they have a cable root system that grows close to the soil surface to increase oxygen absorption because in the mud and in the soil, there's low amounts or no amounts of, of uh, oxygen, uh, the anaerobic soils. Uh, they have vertical root branches that grow in the air to be able to also increase oxygen absorption. Uh, they have stilt roots, so they're, they're growing up in the air. They have really large buoyant seas that can float and are easily transported by ocean currents. And they're also able to absorb minerals and ions and carbon compounds to be able to increase the osmotic uh, potential and thus water absorption in this very salty saline environment, similar to what we see with the, the, the lime grass uh, as well. And so these are two very different environments uh, and these different plant species have developed over time adaptations to help them to be able to survive in these different environments. The distribution of species throughout a geographic region or even throughout the world is really dependent on the particular abiotic factors that are present uh, and the species adaptations for a particular environment. And plants and animals have uh, some specific conditions, abiotic conditions that influence that. Uh, plants dis distribution is to primarily influenced by temperature, water availability, light intensity, soil pH, soil salinity, and mineral availability. All of these things influence where and how plants, uh, plant species are distributed. Typically plants have a, ro uh, a range of tolerance level for these different factors. Uh, so it's not just one set pH that they're able to survive in. There's a, a range and the adaptations uh, then are specific to those particular environmental conditions. Animals do have some factors, a, a little bit uh, less specific, uh, and distribution is typically influenced by temp temperature and water availability. And similar to plants, the adaptations that these different animal species have are specific to the environment. So we've established that uh, plants and animals have uh, a range of abiotic factors that they're able to tolerate uh, and be able to survive in, and all of their adaptations um, uh, have developed over time for those specific abiotic factors found in their environment. Plants, uh, soil pH, sunlight amount, precipitation, etc. Animals uh, can be temperature, um, uh, salt concentration sometimes in some situations. Uh, those tolerance ranges that these the species can be found within uh, can be investigated experimentally. And typically this is done using a correlation test between the distribution and the abiotic uh, variables by mapping an, ent an entire species range, typically using random quadrant sampling uh, or the use of transect lines. And a transect line is a method used to assess the abundance of a species uh, by laying a physical line and observing species along that line, both at the distance and the angle from the line, to be able to assess uh, what species are present and then at how, what quantity, uh, and then compare that to the different abiotic uh, environmental factors. We can visualize this in a graph by looking at the distribution of species based off of the uh, abiotic factor where uh, there, there's a, a, a range of tolerance where there's many organisms um, because they can, they can tolerate that range. And then through variation, there may be some that are able to survive uh, or tolerate a little bit wider range. But as we move away from that mean uh, here presented with our bell curve, we see fewer and fewer organisms because the, the zone of, of tolerance becomes uh, to the level that they, they can't tolerate the specific environmental conditions. Here we see the comparison of two different conditions, salinity and temperature, in which we uh, see the, the fish or the organism being able to survive in a particular region because of the, the temperature that allows uh, parasites in this example, uh, or if it's too, uh, too salty, so the saline levels are too high, then they can't find prey. And so there's a very specific tolerance range for the organism, but then also for other uh, organisms and species that it interacts with to be able to survive. The formation of coral reefs provide a, a really good example to look at for tolerance levels uh, because they have very specific conditions that they need in order to be able to survive. And coral reefs are built upon the growth of hard corals uh, that form the rocky structure of the reef. Uh, many of these maybe look like rocks, but it's actually living organisms uh, built out of calcium carbonate, uh, among other minerals. And these hard uh, corals contain a mutualistic relationship with zooxanthellae. Uh, they're a single cell dinoflagellate, uh, usually protists, and they live with inside the corals, and that's what gives the corals, uh, these hard corals, it's really bright, beautiful colors. And 
these uh, dinoflagellates, they need light in order to be able to photosynthesize. That's how they are uh, producing their energy and that mutualistic relationship, they're providing energy to the hard coral itself. Uh, without this relationship, the, if, if the conditions um, are not favorable uh, or outside of the tolerance level, uh, then the zoosynthelate actually leave the coral and that causes them to turn white. Uh, this is often referred to as coral bleaching. You saw, probably have seen pictures of this or read about it in the news. And if they don't return, uh, then the coral eventually die. And that is the destruction of the coral reef. Uh, and so the conditions that are necessary for coral and their di dinoflagellates uh, and their mutualistic relationship uh, would include depth, how deep they are. Uh, and this is not really an environmentally um, impacted condition, but they need to be about 50 meters, about 150 feet uh, of, of is their maximum depth. The pH needs to be above 7.8 and that is necessary for the formation of the heart skeleton. For salinity, it needs to be, the levels need to be between 32 and 30, uh, 42, excuse me, parts per trill, a thousand. Uh, clarity, there needs to be the, the ability of sunlight to get through the water so it can't uh, have high turbidity levels because that would block sunlight. And then temperature needs to be between 23 and 29 degrees Celsius. And so all of these conditions have to be met, otherwise then the coral is not able to survive uh, if it, the, the range swings outside of their of these tolerance levels. At a terrestrial level or land, uh, there's also a combination of abiotic factors that uh, result in different uh, in, in development of particular environments and ecosystems. Uh, and so species that are found in different ecosystems often have really similar adaptations due to the similar abiotic factors. And all of the ecosystems of a specific type are referred to as a biome. And so we're gonna look at a couple of the different types of biomes. The principal determining factor of biomes is temperature and rainfall. And in the graph here, we can see the combination of those two uh, abiotic factors and then how that influences the distribution of biomes uh, in, in which biome needs what of those different conditions. Although there are multiple different types of biomes, we see those biomes occurring throughout the planet in different geographic regions. And they're separated by sometimes vast differences, but they exhibit similar characteristics due to those similar abiotic conditions of temperature and precipitation. Because of this, uh, this results in a really good example of convergent evolution, because as species, particularly plants, this is often happening with plants, but as they develop similar adaptations, uh, due to the similar environmental conditions, we see similarities emerge between the species. And this is because of those similar uh, environmental conditions. Through natural selection, the species develop similar adaptations to be able to fit within those particular environments. And, and so plants in deserts, for example, uh, develop adaptations for water conservation and storage. And cacti in North America and euphorias in Africa have similar adaptations um, to be able to store water and retain water regardless of the vast difference between them. They're not closely related plant species, uh, but because of similar environmental conditions, they have a lot of the, the similarities in their functions and adaptations to be able to retain water. And so in this chart, we can see all of the different biomes and we can see the different conditions that are required or necessary for that biome to exist. Uh, temperature, precipitation we've discussed as the primary ones, but also light intensity and seasonal variations contribute to the formation of particular biomes around the world. To finish up our discussion of adaptations for particular habitats and environments, we're gonna look at two specific examples. The first would be hot deserts, and these have very hot daytime temperatures, uh, much colder nights. They have very low annual rainfall totals and oftentimes have long periods of no precipitation at all. And there's little organic matter uh, of soil organisms. There's not a lot of uh, organisms that are found within the soil. Uh, the other example are tropical rainforest characteristics. And this would include uh, high temperatures, lots of uh, precipitation and lots of light intensity. So almost the exact opposite of the deserts. And uh, I'm not gonna do this in the video, but one of the requirements that you will need to be able to do uh, is to identify a plant and an animal that are uniquely adapted uh, for both of these two particular biomes, the hot desert and the tropical rainforest, uh, and identify and be able to describe the adaptations that enable those species to be able to survive in this particular environment. So again, that's both a plant and an animal for hot deserts and tropical rainforest. And there's lots of different options out there. Pick something that's of interest to you. 
So this concludes our discussion of adaptations for particular habitats. In our last section for uh, form and function for section B, we'll look at the jobs or the niches that organisms do to be able to survive in particular environments.